Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We will not be having corporate meetings in the month of August, so make sure you get into a house church. If you're not in a house church now, you're missing out on a lot. Enjoy the worship and the message, and we'll see you in September. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together, to be filled with your worship, with your praise, and with your word. Let our hearts be ready for what you have for us, and let us go forth and do the things that you have us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
But can I tell you some good news? Isaiah 60, from verse 1 to, it says, Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see. For the glory of the Lord rises on, to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears on you. Do you believe it's dark? Do you believe you're the reformer? Do you believe you're the light? Do you believe the world is waiting for you? This is our hour. Satan only has power in darkness. He tries to kill, steal, and destroy. But darkness shines for reformers. It brings me to why Jew and Gentile. In 2022, in my dream, Josiah asked me a question. He said, what am I? I said, you're the king. He said, what are you? I said, I'm Falake. He asked me again, what am I? I said, you're the king. What are you? I'm Falake. Then he said, no, what am I? I was like, I don't know. He said, I'm Jew, and you are Gentile. When he said so, I woke up. I started pondering. Why did he say that? As I was praying about it, the Lord said to me, you have that picture in your home. We have a Ruth and a Naomi. Then the Lord began to tell me that once upon a time, Ruth was lost. She's a Moabite, a Gentile. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, Jewish, takes Ruth and introduces Ruth to Boaz, which is Jesus. Then he said to me, Falake, it is now time for Ruth to bring Naomi back to Boaz. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God said that his dream is to have Jew and Gentile come back as one for the greatest harvest of souls. But like us, we, we, we like comfort. So when God gave the commission, I want you to go to the Gentiles. Guess what they, what they did? They stayed in a holy huddle. They didn't want to go anywhere. Let's check this out. Let's look at the Great Commission. And he told them, Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will follow them, those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Did he not say go into all the world? Right? No, they didn't go. They just stayed. God's plan had always been for Jew and Gentile to be one. So when, when that happened... He said, go. They heard, stay. <laughs> then I started thinking of the church today. Go. We are like, no, we want to stay. Let the evangelists go. 
Hmm. You see, the church is a place of show and tell. Do you know that? The church is a place where we come and say, can I show and tell you? While I was in Safeway, I prayed for somebody, and they got healed. And everybody's like, yay, Jesus! Then I go and sit down. Then somebody's like, well, when I was in Martin, I saw a crippled person. I laid hands on them, and they got healed. We're like, yay! But what we've done is, the church has become the end in all. We come in, we do our worship, we do everything, and we think that that is go. No, no, no. This is an equipping center. The goal is not in here. The goal is out there. The goal is out there. We've allowed poor men called pastors. We've put the burden on them to do the work that we are all supposed to do. We've allowed a one-man show system in the body of Christ because we want to be comfortable. We come in and say, Pastor, you need to go to the hospital and pray for people. No, you need to go. The commission is not stay. Jesus says, go. God wanted the Jews to bring in the Gentiles. But guess what? They didn't go just like we didn't go. So guess what happened? Do you know if you don't go, like Jonah, you will go eventually? Do you believe it? Should I tell you how they went? No, no, no. They didn't come to a church service like this and say, man, she's preaching. I can't wait to get to safe and lay hands on the sick. No, they came to a church service like this and say, great message. I can't wait to hear Satsy tomorrow, Scott on Friday, and then go back and sleep and live my life. I've done church. Hallelujah. No, they didn't do that. They stayed. So let me tell you what happened to them. Acts 8, 1 to 8. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of what? It took persecution for them to go. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers ex except the apostles were scattered through the region of Judea and Samaria. Let me ask you a question. When the persecution came, where were the apostles? They said everybody was scattered except who? The apostles. Oh, so the pastors stayed, then the people became the evangelists because of persecution. But without the persecution, they were intact, cuddly, doing church. Should I continue? Verse 2. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Philip, we're going to not talk about verse 4, but the believers who were scattered, listen to this, they, they don't have a name. They didn't even call their name. They called them the believers who were scattered, preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria. Remember that God had asked them to go to Samaria? But they didn't go. And now, persecution, they are all scattered. Now they are missionaries. They are preaching everywhere. Hey, I know Jesus says we should go to Samaria, but we didn't. Now we're going. Now they are doing the go. So they get to Samaria. And they told the people about the Messiah. Crowd, listen. People are waiting. Do you know people are waiting for us? They are waiting for us to tell them about Jesus. And the Bible says they were eager to hear his message and see miraculous signs. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left the victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. As I was reading this today, I said, no wonder. You see, the miracles happen out there. It can happen in here, but I believe when light gets into darkness, we see the greatest miracles of all. Now, light, you guys are all light. 
We are all shining. Uh, you are all light. There's no difference. If we turned off the light right now and we all have our little lights, you will see the light brighter, right? When God tells us to go, he's not telling us to go out of inconvenience. He wants us to bring our light to the world. So it brings me to why Jew and Gentiles. In Romans 11, it says, did God's people stumble? This is a question. He said, did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to we, the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. Do you, do you hear this? God is saying, when they finally come in, we have not seen revival yet. Now, when Jew and Gentile come together like the Lord has planned it, look out, world, the kingdom of God is advancing and the gates of hell cannot stop it. He said, and if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You by nature were a branch cut off from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to the nature by crafting you into the cultivated trees, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. Then I realized my dream was an invitation to the church. God was inviting us. Would you be in this hour a Ruth that we begin to pray for Naomi to come back to Boaz? Would you be a Gentile that realizes that God never stopped loving his people. To realize that the salvation we preach actually came from the beginning in a church that was Jew and Gentile. To realize that God is coming back to the way it was in the beginning. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be. In the end, the Lord says. Can I ask you a question? Do you know that God is in love with his bride? Do you know that God is in love with his body? And do you know that God loves his family? But the family is not just Gentiles. His family is Jew and Gentile. He loves the world God loves his body, he loves his bride, he loves his family. But when his family comes together, Jew and Gentile, then we need to realize God loves the world. He loves those people that are confused. He loves those that have even had abortion but didn't know. He loves those kids that are confused, that they've been told by their teachers that it is more than male and female, they can be zebras and goats too. He loves those people that are confused. No, I know this. I'm going to say it because the days are coming in the church when you say, let me tell you, God is about family, period. It's a husband and a wife. There's no he, he, and she, she. He gave birth to male and female. That brings persecution, but I don't care. The second thing I want to say to you is abortion is murder. And if you've ever had an abortion and you repent, God will forgive you. But to come to a place like this and think that abortion is okay, you are deceived. 
That is what I'm saying. The world is in darkness and God is saying the greatest harvest is when we Gentiles begin to pray for the Jew. And when the Jew comes together, the world is going to see Jesus Christ for who he truly is. Hallelujah. I'm ending right now because we're going to do communion. But I'm going to read a scripture. I decided to be Bible heavy today. The reason is that I don't want you to trust what I'm saying. I want you to look at what the Bible says. Before I read that scripture, I want to show you my newest flag that I love now. Thanks to Hannah. To get one new man, Jew and Gentile, and there will be one new man. Ephesians two. I'm going to read this. Listen, if you've never been told about this paradigm before, that is what a reformer does. This is something that was broken and lost, but God is inviting us to pick it up to pick it up again if we want to see the greatest revival. Secondly, God wants us to pray for our brothers and sisters, the Jews, to know him as their savior. I know if I asked you, when last did you pray for somebody, a Jewish person? If you're like me, until I had that dream, never. I love them. But I've never thought of praying for them because somehow the devil has told us they are naturally saved. They don't need Jesus. They are going to heaven. That's a lie. They need Jesus as much as we need Jesus. There's only one way. There's only one truth. And there's only one life. There's no way we, anyone will be saved except by Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. So all my life, I never prayed for them because I was told they're special. But they need Jesus as much as you and I need Jesus. But this is the scripture God gave me as I end. You might not have read it this way before, but I'm going to read it to you. Ephesians 2, starting from 11. I want you to, I want you to pay attention to the words. This is very important for you as we take communion today. Ooh, I feel the presence of God. This is very important for you individually as a church. Because when I say church, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about you. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promise God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Verse 13. But now, say now. Everybody say now. now. You have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united who? <laughs> Into one people. When? When? in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. 15, he did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulation. He made peace between Jew and Gentile by creating to himself, can we say that? Let's say that again. By creating... To himself, so form two groups. Form two groups. 
He created from himself from two groups, from the Gentile, one new man, by the blood of Jesus Christ. To get us one body, Christ reconciled both groups by God, to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hosti hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought the good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Verse 18, can we stand up? Can we all read verse 18 together? Now, Can I say that? Is there a dividing wall any longer? Is there a separation any longer? We look at the Jews, or even among his people, should there be a dividing wall any longer? Should there be a separation any longer after what Jesus did on the cross? The Bible ends by saying it was because of what Jesus did on the cross that we became one new man. Today I'm going to invite you. We're going to do something together as a family. Some of you are from different places. Not all of you are from the collective. And I know that. So I'm going to invite you to go to the back there and get your communion. And when you get it, bring it to your seat.